Thor, Heimdall, Hulk, Loki. They all lay defeated. Thor, binded by the very ship he had used to escape the destruction of his home world, as he watches a long haired warrior killing every Asgardian who hadn't escaped on the second ship and had survived his initial assault. The only positive for being able to think of is the fact that some of them had escaped and had headed to Earth, knowing the Avengers would defend them. As Thor struggles against his bindings, looking around towards a group of people the long-haired warrior had arrived with, not one had moved since getting here. The only one who had was a gauntlet-wearing man who had moved a few inches, but that was it. And it was only to mould the ship to become the chains that bound Thor, leaving his comrades defeated on the floor. With everyone on the ship, Apart from Thor, Loki, Heimdall, Hulk, and these intruders dead, the long-haired man announces that the ship has been cleared. Hearing this, Thanos walks forward, into the light, revealing him to be missing his left eye and having a massive scar across his face. Thanos gets close to the long-haired warrior, saying that he's proud of his son as he approaches Thor, asking for the god to hand over the Infinity Stones saying how he will allow him and his allies to escape. But Thor says how they were both left and destroyed at the same time on Asgard during Ragnarok, causing Thanos to tighten the bindings on Thor, making him scream out in pain as he demands answers. Loki, who can hardly stand, speaks up saying that he has both, grabbing the attention of everyone present. Thor looks over to his brother, as a feeling of betrayal washes over him. Loki begins to make a deal, offering the two infinity stones for everyone's life. His brothers, Hawks, Heimdalks, and his self. Hearing this, Thanos agrees, making Loki reach down and grab two things. One being the Mind Stone, which had been taken to Asgard for safekeeping. He quickly hands it over to Thanos, who was thrilled to have collected another stone, adding it to his gauntlet straight away and revealing something to Loki, something of interest. For a second, Thanos is stunned from the power of the stone gives him, something that grabs his attention. So, as he begins to reach down towards the Tesseract, handing it over to Thanos, telling him that his life is in his hands, Thanos smiles with his lifelong goal being one step closer, as he crushes the Tesseract, finding the Space Stone, and adding it to his gauntlet. Thor screams out to his brother, calling him a traitor, grabbing the attention of the entire Black Order. As the Space Stone is added, Thanos begins to grunt and, and is paralysed by the pain, allowing Loki a chance to strike. As a dagger apparates in his hand, the Mad Titan can only watch as he jabs it straight towards Thanos' throat, who is unable to move, only watch as the dagger grows closer and closer, only being mere inches away from his throat. But then, the sound of screaming cuts through the air. The Black Order, confused at what was going on, look away from Thor, seeing the source of the screaming, that being Loki. Having had his left arm completely removed from its shoulder, the god falls to the floor, gripping his shoulder in pain, as he fights back the growing drowsiness overtaking him, as blood pours out of his body. Everyone looks confused before the long-haired warrior reappears, with a blade of light covering his right hand, he looks towards his father, apologising for not noticing the attack sooner. Thanos, having recovered from the pain and shock, speaks only a thanks to his son, as he looks down to where Loki lays to find the tricks of God being in a pool of his own blood. Thor, enraged, watches his brother slowly dying, screams out to Thanos, saying that he gave over the stones, they had a deal, and this screaming awakens Heimdall, who looks over to see Loki dying, seeing what has transpired, and gathering up every bit of strength he has, he opens the Bifrost one more time, this time not only to save Loki, but also Banner. As a bright rainbow light races through space, it takes both Hulk and the injured trickster to Earth, in hopes that it will save the universe. Having done this, Heimdall dies a slow and peaceful death, while Thanos watches unamused. He didn't care. He was a man of his word, and true to his word, he doesn't kill Thor, leaving him bound to the ship, floating through space. 
with no way of knowing if his brother will survive. Verve has the power they need to stop Thanos, and having hoped Loki noticed the tail around the warrior's waist, hoping that they can warn them that Thanos' son is the same. As he drifts off into space, the only thing he can prey on hoping is that the distress beacon he had activated will save him. Meanwhile, on Thanos' ship, the man gives the order, sending all of the Black Order to Earth, being the location of one of the last three Infinity Stones. They follow his order and take another ship towards the planet, declaring how they will bring it back for him. All the while, Thanos and Raditz look at each other, as Raditz asks if it's finally time for a family reunion. The man nods his head as they begin to walk off, heading for a portal created by the Mad Titan. Please, Mickey, don't sue me, do do do. And that is all we are doing, in case the mouse hears. But seriously, Disney, please don't hurt me. Uh, I watched all of these films and owned the DVDs. Anyway, moving on with the story. The Z Warriors strike again. General Ross swears to catch them. The hero group known as the Z Warriors strike once again, saving a sinking cruiser in the middle of the ocean, saving every passenger on board preventing any casualties and returning all on board the vessel to dry land before disappearing, before receiving any thanks. Narrowly avoiding the authorities, eyewitness reports claim to have seen Wukong, or the Monkey King, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, confirming that all three members of the team were present on the scene of the incident. However, no witness can confirm the condition of any of our heroes, but having heroes around still working hard after the disbanding of the Avengers, helps keep people's hope high, and leaves many wondering the state of the other missing members of the former Heroes of Earth. As Wanda finishes reading the short article on their team's most recent deployment, she looks over to her brother, who currently stands in the kitchen, making the trio some food in a rather small kitchen. Wanda emphasises how close the paper was to saying narrowly avoided, since they could see the army approaching, and if it wasn't for Petro's super speed, they would have never gotten away. So if Petro does nod his head to, saying he agrees, but they managed to save more than 200 lives with their last mission, so it was well worth the risk. Something Wanda has a hard time arguing with, but she does think that next time they need a better escape plan. After all, all it will take is one mistake before something eventually goes wrong. Petro nods his head in agreement too. A second of silence sets over the pair, as Petro speaks of asking his sister to go get her boyfriend, since food is nearly done. She nods her head, walking towards a door, and opening it to show a small caravan in the middle of a forest, located near a mountain. With Wanda already knowing where to find Goku, she looks up a mountain, and starts floating up the edge of it. At the peak of the mountain we find Goku, meditating while floating off the ground. Rocks float around him, as if caught in his orbit. The Saiyan does his normal checks of the planet, a habit he had got into in the two years of running from General Ross, as he scans the planet to make sure first of all they weren't followed by anyone, army, civilian, anything. Then when he can confirm that they are in the clear, he checks in on his friends, Cap, Tony, the other Avengers, before finally checking in on his family. He hasn't seen any of them in two years, but he can feel their energy as if he is at home. He can feel his father's energy running around playing with his younger brothers, the energy of his mother presumably cooking in the kitchen, and finally his sister is outside. Her energy is slightly higher than last time he checked. It's clear that not only has she got into the habit of picking up her father's hobby in archery, but also his hobby of martial arts. This makes Goku smile, however he can feel tears welling up in his eyes, having not seen anyone he would call family in two years, as put a toll on his mental health. He sits imagining seeing them, the thought of just being able to hold them once, but before he can think about it too much more, he stops at the sound of Wanda asking if he's okay, causing the sand to open his eyes and touch the ground, stopping his meditating, saying how he is fine, quickly wiping away his tears. Wanda smiles however, gently reminding him that she can feel his emotions, and even then, she wouldn't have to. She can see the tears in his eyes, and knows him very well. Before going on saying that, he knows Petro would run him to the house, even for five minutes, just so he could hug them and hold them for just a few seconds. But Goku shakes his head, saying that General Ross is waiting for one of them to make a mistake. He is waiting for one of them to get emotional. He's waiting for one of them to slip up. 
If he's to go and see his family, he might get captured, which could lead to Petro getting captured, which could lead to Wanda getting captured, and worse for it could lead to his father losing his house arrest, and that's not something he wants to risk. As he fights back the tears in his eyes, Wanda cups Goku's cheeks, asking if there's anything she can do to help, but he shakes his head, saying that just being around her helps, causing the pair to embrace their relationship having started a year into them being on the run. As they hug atop the mountain, the sun begins to set in the background, and Wanda remembers why she came up here in the first place, alerting Goku to the fact that food is nearly ready. Hearing this, the Saiyan forces a smile, food still being one of his many loves. So with a smile on his face, he picks up his girlfriend and flies her down the mountain as the pair head into the house, getting ready to sit down and eat. This having become the gang's favourite pastime, as it's the only time in the day where they can feel like normal people. They forget they're on the run, they forget they are wanted, and for the first time in a day, they can act like people. They can act like a family. They act like people who love each other. As they sit eating food which is hardly edible, thanks to Petro not being a very patient chef. They sit down laughing with one another and being normal. It's truly their favourite time. But all good things do come to an end. As night falls, they realise they need to head off to sleep. However, unlike normal, Goku doesn't get woken up by the morning light. Instead, Goku feels something's off in the universe, like something big is coming. As he tosses and turns in his sleep, he can tell something's wrong, he just can't figure it out, which keeps him awake. He stares at his ceiling, concentrating on the energies of Earth, taking the time to feel out everything he can, but nothing feels out of place, even the crying groups he knows the energies of are inactive. So why does he feel so uneasy? But that's when, in America, no, New York to be precise, he feels the energy of two people he knows, and he's concerned. Why are they here? Why are they here now? One of them is bad news, but the other is an old teammate. He knows something's going down, and he just knew something was happening. So quickly, he wakes up his teammates, saying that they need to get to New York right now. This confuses the two, but Goku tells them that Loki and Banner have just shown up on Earth. Having only heard stories of what Loki can do through Goku, they know something bad must be happening, and the fact Banner has returned after all these years is confusing, so they need to get ready for whatever attack is coming to Earth. So once they are all dressed, once they are all ready, they head out of the caravan, getting grabbed by Petro, who starts running. Thanks to his time of being on the run, and just being friends with Goku has led to the man training very often, meaning Petro top speed is so much faster than he ever thought possible. So even though Petro has to carry two other people, at his top speed, he can make it to New York in no time. Five minutes tops, even though the trio are currently living in a different country altogether. So soon, the group arrive in Central Park. The speedster is completely exhausted, however. The lack of sleep, not helping. Goku apologises for asking his friend to do that, as Petro drops to one knee, panting for breath, just giving a thumbs up signalling that he is fine. Goku, seeing where they are, flicks his hood up, hiding his face, advising that his friends do the same. As they quickly follow the orders of their leader, Petro stands on his feet, asking where they are going. Goku closes his eyes, finding the energy of the two people who had just crash-landed on the planet. Once locking onto it, he starts walking, with the twins following along behind him. The trio walk for a while before Goku clutches his head in pain. Something's coming. A power like he's never felt before approaches Earth. Goku clutches his head harder as he fights back the feeling of throwing up. He really doesn't know what's coming and he doesn't ever want to know. As Wanda grabs her partner's shoulder, asking what's wrong. But before Goku can answer, the sound of people screaming does it for him. As each hero looks up to see a giant spaceship entering the atmosphere. Wanda asks if that's what caused his headaches, making the mad nod, saying how they need to get over there as fast as possible. As he looks to Petro, the man sighs, saying, okay. We cut back a few moments. At the moment, Loki and Hulk had crash-landed in New York Sanctum. In these few seconds, Hulk reverts to Banner, while Loki lay bleeding out, hardly clinging to consciousness. 
as Tony, seeing Banner, rushes over to check on his friend. While Wong and Strange look confused at one another, unsure of what to do about the bleeding out guard. But before Banner says anything else, he turns to check on Loki, see if he can help the bleeding in any way, trying to slow it down. Tony is completely confused, asking what he's doing, but Banner just explains that Loki has changed, and right now, a real threat is coming to Earth, which is much worse than him or Ultron. All three heroes are confused, but Banner shouts out asking for help. This causes Wong to cast some sort of spell, which not only stops the bleeding, but also covers the wound. Banner, seeing that Loki is safe, turns to Tony, saying that they need to get the whole team together as fast as possible, as something is coming to Earth much worse than they could have ever feared, and possibly the worst thing they will ever face. But when he says this, Tony pulls a face as he tries to look for words to tell Banner the state of the Avengers, but the sound of screaming cuts him off as they walk outside seeing people rushing away from the street. The four heroes fight through the crowd, moving upstream, with our heroes going against the flow of it all. As they find themselves staring down a giant spaceship, they all look on horrified, but none more than Banner, who looks terrified, saying that this must be the Black Order, as a bright blue light bursts from the ship, touching down on the planet for only a second before disappearing leaving behind four warriors. Ebony Moore seeing the four heroes standing in front of them, announces how they are here on order of Thanos, telling the earthly beings to surrender their lives to the mad titan Thanos. Banner, seeing all four present, tells Tony he needs to call for backup right now, and he needs to do so fast. And it's in this moment Tony looks over to Banner, saying that the team no longer exists. Making Banner ask why, Tony isn't sure what to say, and while this is going on, Strange tries to talk to Ebony Moore and the rest of the Black Order, trying to talk them into leaving the planet. All the while, he prepares for battle, Wong by his side, ready to fight with him. Ebony Moore, seeing that the Earth group won't be giving up easy, orders the rest of the Black Order to kill them. Obsidian, Corvus and Proxima all walk forward, getting ready to steal the Infinity Stone wrapped around the wizard's neck. As the three warriors start to approach, Banner, hearing Strange has an Infinity Stone, tries to convince the Doctor to leave, to prevent them from getting their hands on it, but Strange refuses, saying he is here to defend Earth, and the Eye of Agamotto. Tony, seeing the size and presumed strength of Obsidian, asks for Banner to get ready and bring out the big guns, leading to Banner learning the internal conflict between himself and Hulk. When he cannot bring forth the Green Giant, Tony answers, activating his nanotech and fighting off Obsidian, flying around and blasting at him. All the while, Corvus and Proxima fight off Doctor Strange and Wong. However, something's off about this Black Order. They're different from the ones we've seen in canon. They're faster, they're stronger than ever before, as they easily put the heroes on the back foot within seconds. Our heroes take to playing defensive, Tony playing keep away by firing shots from a distance and staying in the air while Wong and Strange use defensive spells to block and deflect any attacks coming from Corvus or Proxima. Ebony Moore, seeing his team holding their own against Earth forces, starts to approach the battlefield as well, his eyes solely locked on Doctor Strange. Banner, seeing this, shouts out to the others, warning them of what's happening, but before anyone can react, a bright blue orb of energy hits Obsidian in the face, making him stagger backwards, and stops all the fights around them, confused at what just happened. A few seconds go by before Strange and Wong feel a weird pulling sensation, which moves them back ten feet as a blur rushes between them, lariating Proxima and Corvus, knocking them both on their back before the blur reappears in front of Strange, showing Quicksilver. He apologises, asking if he was moving too fast in a cocky way towards Proxima and Corvus. With him doing this, Wanda walks forward, apologising to Wong and Strange for pulling them back so hard. Tony is shocked to see them, but more so when he hears a voice, one he hasn't heard in a few years, shouting out telling Petro to get everyone out of here. Tony looks up, and at first, the sun blinds him, all he can see is a silhouette, but in that moment he could have swore Clint was up there, but as his eyes adjust, he realises he was thinking of the wrong Barton, as Goku sits holding a bow made of some sort of blue energy in his hands, with a serious look on his face. He draws back the string of this spectral bow, firing off another blue orb towards Obsidian. However, once fired, the orb multiplies, slamming into Obsidian in a barrage of blasts, knocking him back a few good feet, before shouting out to Petro to get everyone out of here now. 
Speedster apologises, having got caught up in the moment, as he turns to Banner and Wong, grabbing both and disappearing. Strange is confused, asking why they took one of their fighters, causing Goku to say, If we were to fight them now, we'd lose. No questions asked. I can sense a difference in strength between us and them. So right now, our best chance is pulling back and regrouping, and saving the world as a bigger group. Tony is shocked to hear the normally fight crazy kid he used to know be so tactical and well-adjusted, but he doesn't have time to think on it much, as Proxima, having snuck out of the view of everyone after getting knocked over, jumps towards Tony, going for a surprise attack. However, Wanda reacts fast, blocking the attack with her psionic powers and pushing the alien woman back a few good feet. Tony asks Goku if he's 100% sure they can't win, and the Saiyan looks unsure for a second. Truthfully, he thinks he could probably hold his own against one of them, and Wanda could probably fight off another, and with some support, truthfully, he thinks they could win. But something feels wrong about this entire situation, like there's something more to this group than he can tell. Something he can't sense, something he can't see. He doesn't know what it is, but he doesn't want to risk going into a fight and getting caught off guard by something they have. So he shakes his head, saying no, making Tony nod his head as he talks to Jarvis, telling him to send the Iron Legion to distract the Black Order. As the hundred robots who had been working on clearing the area of civilians due to an order Tony had given subtly earlier, rushed towards the Black Order. The Iron Legion had been able to hold off Goku from two years back and have only been improved since then. However, the Black Order easily destroys them one by one. Tony realising he has only brought them a few seconds gets ready to fly off, advising Strange to follow them. The Sorcerer is unsure, but knowing this is the best way to keep the Eye of Agamotto safe, he nods his head, using a sling ring to escape to the New York Sanctum, advising that everyone else follows him. With Wanda and Tony rushing through fast, Goku jumps down from the building and runs across the street. As he goes through the portal, he looks back to see the Black Order having destroyed all of the Iron Legion. He stares at them, telling them that next time they meet, they'll be on his terms, on his battlefield, and if they value their lives, they won't show themselves or else next time he sees them, he'll make sure they die, for threatening his planet and the place he loves. And the portal closes. But Ebony Moore saw something. In those few seconds of seeing his face clearly, in those few seconds of seeing pure anger on that boy's face, Ebony Moore couldn't help but remember Raditz. They look so similar. The energy projectiles, claiming to be able to sense life forms. All signs that that warrior was a Saiyan. Realising this complicates things ever so slightly, but having been used to training it against Saiyans, having been a tool for training Thanos' son to grow stronger, a Saiyan isn't terrifying to the Black Order, just a slight inconvenience. He does give worth to Thanos, but never hears anything back. So, they plan to continue on with their mission, and get the Time Stone off the Sorcerer. As we cut to the Sanctum Sanctorum, Goku looks at Strange, thanking him for leaving the fight, but the Doctor only says that it's his duty to protect Earth and the Eye of Agamotto, but he needs to know what the next move is, because he needs to do whatever's best to protect this planet and the Eye of Agamotto. Goku hearing this only smiles as he looks towards Tony, saying that he's planning on getting the team back together, but this time with a few more members. As we see over with Petro, he has ran over the ocean and is currently cutting through a herd of elephants before stopping suddenly. All three heroes drop to their knees as Petro struggles for a breath, having used his top speed for far too long, carrying people far too heavy. But he had managed to make it to Africa, and he had done it in a personal best time, something he can be proud of once he's caught his breath. As for Wong and Banner, they start throwing up. Not being used to travelling at such high speeds, they feel their whole body as if it's turning inside out. It was a terrible feeling for them. Once Petro sees this, he apologises, having forgot that people who aren't used to his speed might experience something like this. As Banner remarks that he was not that fast last time he saw him, it makes Petro struggle out a laugh saying that his best friend is a psycho who loves training, so he was bound to get faster at some point. He just was never expecting to get this fast. Banner, who knows all too well what Goku is like, remembering the kid who always wanted to fight the Hulk. He understands Petro better than most. Wong, having finished puking, asks where they are, and that's when a voice speaks out saying how they are on the border of Wakanda, as T'Challa, joined by Bucky, walks out of nowhere, asking what brought Petro back so suddenly as the boy says that they need T'Challa's help, 
as something dangerous is coming to Earth. This is where I'm leaving this part for now, just on the cusp of something big. I'm sorry to leave it here, after all I didn't cover too much, but the next part is actually planned to be quite a long one, so I wanted to get all of this full of stuff out of the way. That being said, I hope people enjoyed this part, and are interested in seeing what happens next. It was a weird part to write for, and Infinity War is a weird film to sit down and rewatch a few times to figure out the changes in the story. Things like new fighters who should never be around being around, or Vision not being around, it's just, it was just a bit weird for me to write for, but this led to Thanos getting two Infinity Stones for the price of one in the attack on Asgard, and for people who are wondering why Heimdall could send two people in this timeline, it's thanks to the fact he had enough time thanks to a distraction made by Loki, leading to him being able to gather up a lot more strength and be able to send off not only Banner but also Loki, which I'm sure people will be happy about as I have plans for the Trickster God, uh, and I think I should say this now, and I'll probably say it at the start of the next video, just kind of as a disclaimer, but I think the things that happen out in space with the Guardians won't be covered. I can't see their timeline changing all that much. The only thing I had considered changing was Gamora, who would probably be more cautious of Thanos due to the fact that he had a Saiyan on his side, but seeing how she was in the original timeline, knowing how strong he was, even with the Infinity Stones, she still went for him. I don't think things would change all that much. So I'm going to say that the things that happened with the Guardians, from Finding Thor to Gamora's kidnapping, stay the same. So keep watching to see what changes for them. As for the story itself, I hope everyone enjoyed. And all I've got to say is I hope you all have a great day and a good night. And hopefully you'll show up next time. Have a good one, guys.